our talk is the next phase in open source, right? So ideally, before you talk about what the next phase is, you need to understand what the current phase is. So my first question, I'd like to hear thoughts from both of you is, in your opinion, what would you say the current phase of open source is in Africa and like in the global South in general? That's quite interesting. Um, I would say the current phase, uh, um, it's, it's quite interesting because I would say just a few years ago, um, I would like to naturally would say advocacy, but I think um, where I think, especially in the global South now with all the statistics we're seeing from, you know, GitHub, and I think there was something recently done by Eclipse, um, the goal, I think basically what we've been seeing lately is projects, right? I think that's kind of what's, what's been, what's been happening and not just projects, but also project that potentially becomes, you know, uh, company. So in this case, I would say commercialize, even if some people might be offended by what I'm about to say, but, uh, commercialize open source, uh, uh, structure. And I think those kind of the things that, um, um, I'm seeing because it's a very heavy, um, developer centric um, region. Um, and I, so I think that's kind of where I would say the, the current phase of open source is. Um, so personally, because I, um, more on the engineering side, I'd say that what I've been seeing of recent is that we groom engineers and these engineers leave once they become mid-level engineers and then go to contribute to open source in, in the West. <laughs> and then, um, there's a huge shortage of that engineering talent. So I keep seeing that happening year after year. So we groom engineers, engineers become mid-level or senior engineers. They go for, or like they go to places with greener pastures and then become engineers. They're solving um, problems that are more focused on those places. And I wouldn't blame them per se because um, we face very unique challenges, like um, infrastructure challenges. I mean, so when we talk about this, it's very unrelatable when you say that somebody doesn't have power in their house for maybe one week, but it's a reality um, where we come from, you know? So um, people kind of struggle through the first um, few years. And as soon as they become they get to a level in engineering, they kind of live and they live with the open source projects that they've created or go somewhere else to add to the statistics of the open source contributors there. And um, yeah, we just keep seeing that happening year after year. So that's what um, I've been seeing um, in the last maybe four or five years now. Yeah, so that's what I'd say the state is currently. All right, cool. Thank you. Just a bit more on that. Um, what I would like to get more context on is, let's say we have 100 developers in Africa or the global south. That's like really, really small. I'm sure we have way more than that. But what, where would you say, um, like in terms of like advocacy, adoption, actually building your own project or just knowing that open source exists or making a few contributions here and there, where would you say the majority of people in Africa are? Like are they mostly in the, oh, okay, I know that this is what open source is or, oh, I know what open source is and I'm contributing to it or I know what open source is, I'm actually building projects that are open source. That's like what, what I would like to know. Um, again, I'm going to speak as an engineer because that's my field. So I contribute to Kubernetes, for example. And if you look at the contributor stats on the official, like, um, I can't remember what it's called now, but there's a place where they collect all those stats. Um, it's not a survey. Yeah, some insights um, and all that. If you look at countries, for example, um, I, I think I'm the only one that's currently contributing um, from Nigeria. So I wouldn't say that um, people aren't contributing, but 
with how difficult a project is, like you, you keep seeing the numbers reducing. So there are various individual contributors. However, um, there aren't a lot of people that are building open source projects from scratch. They are contributing to open source, but they are not creating. We've seen people create um, open source projects. However, the ratio um, between individual contributors and creators is really um, disproportionate. So that's what I'd say. Yeah, for me, I kind of have a little bit of a different context. Um, for me, I think it's there's a reason for those statistics, right? I think um, even if you go to the North America, because <clears throat> most people here, I think most people in this conference are kind of being paid to work in open source. There's open source program office. If you go to Europe, there's some government with open source program office. In fact, the UN right now is trying to find a way to standardize open source program office again through government, right? So I think it's it's almost like the 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 the, the persona of people that are contributing from those regions are people that are trying to be intentional about their career. And when they grow, and I'm saying this because that's how my career started. Uh, my first ever personal computer was a Linux distro, it wasn't Windows, right? So I kind of was born into it. But then I was really intentional about keeping that trajectory, making sure that I wasn't digressing. But again, I wasn't the only person that had that computer. It was like a thousand people in my school and everybody's doing something very different. The ones that are still in tech, I don't think even probably know the word open source, right? And the reason is because, like I said, again, there are people that are paid to do these things, right? And, and, and on an average, people that are paid to work in open source in Nigeria, in Africa, in some part of Africa, are not enough to influence or to 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 kind of like what's the word to influence their peers and that's why again because again if you're thinking about contributions if you start looking at outreach programs like outreach he google some of code google coding when it used to be a thing there were a lot of nigerians there were a lot of africans but again like i said it was specifically for the context of improving their career once it's solid they switch direction because there are not a lot of companies that hoard that talent and you know, most of the open source program office are very US centric. So that's kind of where the problem starts from. So yeah. cool, cool. Thank you. So from both of the explanations, I think some of the things I'm saying is we do have um like contributors, right? But then it's not the majority of people. The majority of people in tech who are aware of open source or actually adopt or contribute to it are mostly on the Oh, okay. I actually know what this thing what this thing is about or how it works. So my question to Samson is, why do you feel like this is the best time for us to move to that next phase of open source, which would be more active contribution, more active building, and not just education on what open source is? Yeah, from my point of view, like I've been doing, um, you know, mostly DevRel, like yourself, with and mostly like targeting um, startups and. Particularly, I'm very intentional about the kind of companies I work with. Um, they has they they need to be some kind of like an open source programs or element in it. Um, some of the companies I've worked with have been in this case in this case in the CMCF landscape in in the open SSF side. Uh, my previous company was Chainguard, um, you know, and that indirectly made me you know, contributed to Six Door, right? So. Again, if you look at the new set of companies that are coming up, I would say the new set of startups that are coming up, right? It's not the next social media. It's, it's, it's always very focused on dev tools, like developer first. Um, that's the new trend. Um, um, if you pay attention, in, even in Europe, right? Again, like if you pay attention to the new line of startups, especially startups that are, that are, that are open source related are dev tools. And, and I think, why it was impossible to basically re start Silicon Valley from a scratch in, 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 in this case, like have some one, one country host Silicon Valley or whatever. I think this is the perfect time because when you're doing dev tools, you kind of would want to be focused on solving a problem 
that that you know that relates to you you know and then most people when they start that company it's always like oh i was trying to fix this problem and then i realized that this was a global problem like for example um uh, where i used to do um devrel in in sourcegraph i think they were trying to solve a particular problem then they realized that oh a lot of enterprise customers or enterprise companies were having that problem and then that's how they started the company so again i think because of the current phase of again the new trend of companies coming up i think this is just about the right time to enable engineers to think more around like again why do you think local you know they definitely have to think global with your solutions so, yeah. yeah okay cool cool so just to pick in on that what i would ask is what do you think this next phase is going to look like like in your own thoughts this next phase like you've just talked about that we need to go to in the global south what do you think that phase would ideally look like? Dev tools. That's what I can think of right now. I, I can just think of dev tools. That's what's in my head right now. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so question to Princess. So one of the things that we're working on at Oscar, which is Open Source Community Africa, is the IDB program, which we've created because we think it's going to help us move to that next phase where it's not just about telling people, hey, there is this stuff called open source, or you can actually adopt it, but actually building up projects, right? So my question to you, Princess, is how do we plan to use this program to achieve or enter into that next phase of open source? Um, so I'd say that it's really about tipping the scale from um, individual contributors to creators. Like I said initially, um, the people we have locally, we have a lot of developers, right? However, the people we have locally keep living. Um, but even at that, we still have developers, right? So it's really about tipping the scale from individual contributors to creators who actually solve for local problems. Like there are a lot of problems that are niche to us and that are not relatable, right? They are not relatable. So it's this um, accelerator is really about tipping the scale towards um, Create, creating more open source projects that are solving our own local problems and not just, I mean, there's nothing wrong with um, contributing to um, global open source projects. Like a lot of people are already doing that. So um, I think that even as we focus on those global projects, we also need to look inwards and solve for really pressing needs like we have a lot of problems that th the surface has not been scratched yet like there are a lot of things that we need to solve for and while maybe i am contributing to kubernetes i also need to be thinking of the problems that we have back home i think that's really about it awesome thank you so much um so samson what i'd like you to explain what the IDB program is, first of all, what does IDB mean, right? Like that's like an abbreviation. So let us know what it means and then what your thoughts are on the program, like a brief summary, so to speak. Yeah, cool. Um, I mean, we're still internally um, um, battling with the names. That's what happens when you're trying to launch something abstract. But yeah, um, so far, I mean, at least the, the ones we've agreed upon um, is, is the idea, uh, basically uh, the idea aspect and of course design and then the next is build. And that's really intentional because um, the three keyword that kind of promotes, you know, the ability for us to, you know, bring in different um, diverse skill sets. So beyond engineers, you know, you're looking at product managers, you're looking at um, QA engineers, you're looking at, um, you know, designers. So again, you're basically like forming like a, a smaller uh, company and in like you know team of five or team of six right um so the, the the idb initiative or the concept of the accelerator program and for context it's kind of like i would say think about um if i don't know if it's like if github um accelerator program do i like to explain it's a github accelerator program 
meets i don't know outreach and then they they have a baby like something in between that i don't know but it's a weird concept i'm thinking about but yeah um it's 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 kind of um uh, the goal like i said right it's we're trying to enable an environment where um people that have some certain level of skill set because there's two things right the average persona uh, that you meet in the global south are self-taught right they are um, and ruth gave a very interesting talk um yesterday about this and ruth and perry gave a talk about this they are self-taught myself also self-taught right um, um most people you meet are self-taught uh, i stumbled upon um, writing code because i wanted to install a windows application in linux which is pretty disastrous and that's how i discovered code um so that's kind of the different personas of how people ventured into um, programming or in this case um, um, um join tech so given that fact a lot of companies well it's a little bit easier now before it was very degree-based recruitment right it was like oh you would did you go to harvard or stanford or, or you know these top schools and it was part of the, the the recruitment process and of course it was a little bit different but now thankfully we live in a very different age in tech where it's more skills based versus you know what college you went to even if it's a little bit still um, not that big so given the way things are set up um a whole lot of people are very experienced in their in their own bubble and why i'm saying that is because somebody would possibly understand python or or, or ruby or in this case golang and be the amazing stuff but then lock it on the github private repo no one has any idea of how this person um, skill set is and until they get to come to conferences like open source summit or open source festival we host locally and then see the reason why they need to make it public then it's just based on oh you need to trust that i'm a, I'm a good engineer right it's like it's like just believe me that i'm a good engineer and the reason why they don't have that context is because again they don't really understand the ideology of, of open source or maybe they know what it is but don't really get the culture behind it. So IDB is coming to enable people that have this skill set already. We're not teaching people how to code or how to design, but people that already understand these things with some degree of experience yeah. coming to a team. And then the primary goal of that team is to come up with an idea that they would design and then they would build. You see what I did there? IDB. <laughs> Right, so they'll, 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 they'll come in together and then of course they would design and then they would build something. And, and of course, with the longer term goal to enable, you know, open source VCs, which is kind of a new term now, especially if you're in the, in the startup space, that would enable the open source VCs to see these tools and try to invest in them. Or in this case, potentially go to get our accelerator program and continue that effort. But again, it's mostly trying to enable these people to build initiatives that are either local or global or both, right? And then cultivate that idea where they were able to like sell it and of course, you know, build a company and then start from there. Or the secondary goal here, which we're trying to solve is get an existing open source project that is big maybe that people are not really focusing on uh, for context there's a huge list on github right now called made in africa and also made in nigeria um, um, um princess mentioned about people starting an open source project building an open source project and then leaving the open source project right and then some companies rely on, on it and individuals relying on those things so it's also an opportunity for people to for this this team um, and also the IDB initiative to work with existing open source project and get that project into the, the, the program and then give these people room to have the ideology of like, what is open source? And then within that process, because it's, it's going to be a six months timeline, there's going to be the series of mentorship, right? Where they, 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 they get they get what open source is beyond open source 101 but also get some ideas from like industry leading experts, right? And of course, including VCs. But again, there's a, there's a great knowledge, um, 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 information being passed to these people from understanding the concept of open source 
to starting something in this case a project or a company and of course to more like team bonding and enable these people to be the next generation of builders right so it, that's kind of like the the overview or i would say the high level of what we're trying to achieve amazing thank you so much for the detailed explanation um so the next question is princess um what I'd like to know is, are there specific requirements to be part of the IDB program? Like, can anybody just wake up and say, okay, hey, I'm going to join this stuff? Or do you need to have certain, like, skills and stuff like that? And if your answer is yes, I'd like to know what the vetting process is for this. Because whatever skill you're mentioning, there are several people who would have that skill, right? So how do we decide who should be part of the program that is going to ensure that it becomes a success? Because at the end of the day, you want this thing to be able to work. So what's the vetting process and what are the requirements to give you a chance at being part of the program? Um, thank you. So of course, there's a vetting process. Um, I don't think we're at a level where we should be teaching people how to code anymore. I mean, I don't have any problem with that. However, um, in this program, like we want to focus on people that already have really good skills. Like you have good engineering skills. There's a vetting process and trust me, it's a very rigorous process. So um, the vetting process starts with, so of course the program is, the, there's the ideate, there's the design, there's the build. So this is um, a lot of skill sets coming together for, so for each of those, um, for each of those sections, there are people that are in charge of vetting people before they come in. And it's not just like one step. Oh, you take the initial, there's the initial vetting. There's also another vetting. There are also, there's also another vetting by experts. So it's not just a program that anyone can come into um, because we're focusing on people who already have this skill set. I don't think that... Um, we're not focusing on people who want to learn how to code. No, that's not we are no, what, what we are focusing on. We are focusing on people who already know how to code or people who already have some tech skill or ex and experience, not just the tech skill, you also have an experience, but then you want to go ahead to build an open source project that you could potentially um, maybe turn into a company or like build something out of so um that's who we are focusing on cool thank you just to confirm though because i mean you said rigorous and rigorous several times um it's it's not just for experts right it could be for intermediates or even beginners who have knowledge about the like what they are trying to build like i just want to be sure that you're not inferring that the program is just for people who have it all figured out and are experts like there should be room for learning as well through the program i assume um yes there's room for learning however um yeah we want to focus on people that already have those skills and we could augment you know of course we do the augmenting thing where more junior people learn from people who are more senior but um I would say that this is actually focused on um, experienced people. Okay. Um, thank you, Samson. Do you have any thoughts to share on that? Okay, cool. Awesome. So um, the next question I have is, so assuming I see this program online when it gets launched and I'm like, okay, I'm going to apply and I go through the different um, steps and I qualify for the, um, the program, I'd like to know what the pipeline is like like what happens when i join how do we define success at the end of the program like what what, what are those things we need to seek to say hey this person successfully um passed through this program and then what would the idb team also classify as success to come and say hey we actually did launch this program and it did move certain people in the global south from just being adopters or people who are aware about what open source is to actually building projects Samson. That's a very tough question. Um, <laughs> trust me, even on my day job, I, I hate talking about metrics, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. So the, the, the thing about, um, uh, I would say, defining success is going to be quite interesting because um, 
you're dealing with different personas. There are personas that are trackable conventionally in, in the technology world we, we play with. So like a software engineer, you could just easily just go to their GitHub and see what's happening there. But then how do you track like, you know, a program manager or how do you track, uh, I don't know, a designer? I mean, there are ways, but it gets, it gets, the more, the more you, the more you go into different skills, the more challenging it gets, right? So that's why f for me, particularly what I'm interested in even seeing is, is the, is the ability to collaborate, right? Is the collaborative spirit that is the most impact because, uh, if you want to, and this is typical of open source project where engineers are giving, you know, um, 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 yeah, I don't want to make more comments about, but we all we all understand the the, the, the typical maintainer um, struggle. But yeah, I think for me, what what is more interested in the IDB side is how collaborative were they all through the process, okay. right? Because one key thing about IDB is, regardless of if they they they, they succeed in building cool stuff, mm -hmm. and 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 eventually making it a company or a project that somebody would adopt, or if they fail there's some basic skills that will be required from like working at some companies, right? And collaborate, especially with the days where, I mean, apart from what, I mean, I don't want to mention the company, but apart from the, comp um, the going, working on site, but like, you know, especially when you're thinking about remotes, there's a lot of conventional um, 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 skill set that you have, that you need to have, you know, some soft skills you need to have. And a whole lot of people don't have that experience because they've been they've been designed to work in silo, right? Yeah. So those fundamental things that make people good candidates, uh, those are the things that we're going to infuse on in them. And I think I think I think in the project um, side of things, it's all about again through the mentorship and through the team metric. Because again, we're trying to make sure that. We're not judge. We're not using one metric to judge every team because there's some people that might do stuff on social impact. Yeah. There's some people that will build stuff in, you know, in in the more dev traditional dev uh, tooling. Very different metric. So it's it's going to look like the things that they initially set for themselves. How much far away, or how close were they in terms of the ideas? And I think that's kind of going to be the very key thing. And of course, output output is project. Uh, um, project would, would make a lot of sense because those are the things that would take them to the next step, especially of our extended partnership. Awesome. Um, Prince, I'd like you to add. Um, so for me, I'd say um, that success would mean actually having a sustainable open source project. Um, let's take again Kubernetes, for example, which I contribute to. So oh, like a lot of my experience is around that. So I can speak to that. I, before this talk, I was in a meeting and there were only about five or six people in that meeting. Tens of thousands of people contribute to Kubernetes, for example, but then there were only maybe five or six people in that meeting, right? However, like if you look at that number, you think, oh, nothing might be going on. However, if you look at Kubernetes, Kubernetes is 10 years this year, you'll see a lot of work that has gone into that project. So for me, success would mean how sustainable was this thing that was built like? How is it being used? How does it actually impact people? I don't think uh, there are many companies that are making use of Kubernetes. There are lots of people contributing to it. Um, there's a lot of sustainability. I don't think that um, I don't think that Kubernetes is going to die anytime soon. You know, I want to see that sustainability around projects and that's what I think that success is going to mean to me. Awesome, really great um, perspective. So I have two more questions for them and then we'll have um, the opportunity for people in the attending section to ask questions. So um, the... Second to the last one would be to Samson, and then the last one would be to Princess. So Samson, uh, I mean, we have amazing people here listening to us talk about the IDP program and, and what's going on in open source in Africa and the global south. So 
assuming someone here wants to um, like participate in this program or like become a partner or something like that, can you share some thoughts around um, how they can come in to support the IDB program or the other initiatives that are meant to improve or increase the growth of open source in Africa and the global south in general? Okay, that, that's a good question. So the Open Source Community Africa is a community that drive advocacy, um, you know, in this case, education, and of course, project. Um, we've been mostly focusing on the advocacy element of it because, again, that was a lot of people needed to understand uh, what open source is um, uh, and, and understand the, the understand it beyond the term open source uh, because, which to be fair, even in the in the in, in, in the other part of the of the world, like in America, even to today, um, there are a lot of foundations that are trying to redefine open source. So nobody knows the true definition of open source in the sense, but yeah, but at least some certain level. Um, yes, yeah, so we've been doing that um, through conferences. Um, next year, actually, we're gonna be doing the Open Source Festival, which is kind of like Open Source Summit, but less corporate -y. I mean, I love Linux, but yeah, um, something similar to that, very developer focused. Um, it's, it's um, something we do annually. We didn't do any this year. But then IDB is another arm, um, just like the festival, uh, which is going to be more project and program focused. So in terms of that level of support, um, what we're looking into having is um, companies or individuals that have tools that would basically enable these people to build faster, right? So I can imagine, for example, if, if, if the... Uh, you know, they want to host something, we need like credits, right? They want to, uh, I don't know, use some AI tool, you know, there, there has to be some level of, of, of expense there. And of course, in terms of, of, and when it makes a whole lot of sense, because we're kind of in the pilot phase right now, when it makes a whole lot of sense, some potential open source project that needs some adoption, adoption in terms of adopt and maintain, um, that comes also can be a conversation, though we're trying to be careful with that right now because of the phase we're in with the project. But I think at this phase, what we what we're specifically we're trying to do is the mentorship process to the tooling process, and then of course the partnership process. The partnership process is after the initiative, um, a company seeking to hire these people. Someone had that conversation with me yesterday about potentially like uh, um, um, getting um, open source engineers that they would want to hire. That that could be a great pipeline. Um, but of course, things like like I said, um, when they eventually build something, um, um, how many accelerator programs that are already out there? Like for example, I could name GitHub Accelerator that could potentially, in this case, take on that project and scale it beyond. Oscar, because Oscar is still a nonprofit. We don't have hundred thousand dollars to, you know, <laughs> continue this project. But yeah, so those are kind of the the things that I envision. Um, um, I'm doing. Of course, if there's things that I'm not mentioning right now that things would make a lot of sense. Again, we're still in our ideating phase, so sure, uh, uh, I'm happy to to have that conversation. Amazing, thank you. One of the things you mentioned that I want to quickly ask is the GitHub Accelerator program. So like in a few words, can you quickly tell us the difference between that program and the IDB Accelerator program? Like what's the difference between um, what we have and what GitHub currently has? This is going to be embarrassing because I'm a GitHub star, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so anyways, the Accelerator program is um, um, a way where if you're building something Again, just like any of the accelerator program, it's just GitHub trying to be more intentional about like uh, housing open source, or in this case, I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to not use the word open source project, but companies that are building open building on top of open source, um, and then and teaching them the way to scale. So it's kind of GitHub way to also enable this company to assess GitHub tools, yeah. varieties of of those tools, and of course including um, um, some kind of cash prizes to help them scale to further them to become, you know, a full-fledged company. So like I said, right, it's like IDB is not just, it's not like GitHub um, accelerator program. It's like a little bit of outreach, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Again, it's 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 kind of a, it's like you're cooking jollof rice. It's like a lot of bit of different sports, right? So again, that's, that's kind of the way I put it. Uh, yeah. Cool. I know one thing you mentioned the time we had a conversation was the GitHub accelerator program is more geared towards um, 
projects that are already existing, right? So like you're already building an open source, you already have some traction, then you can join. But the IDB is more about creating it from scratch, right? Like you come together, you create, like come up with an idea, you design the idea and then you eventually build it. So I would say that's another um, key difference between both of them. All right, so final question to Princess is, what would you say, uh, like, what is the best route that people can reach out to the um, Oscar team or the IDB team in Oscar to um, get more clarity on the program or how they can like, partner or participate? Um, I think the best way to join or partner or maybe become a mentor or just contribute to the IDB project in general is to actually um, reach out to Oscar. Like you can go to the Oscar website, you can send us an email, you can reach us in different ways. There are different ways in which you can reach us uh, that are available on the website. And I'm sure that if you reach us, we'll definitely resend the response to you, yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you so much. Um, that's all of the questions I have on my end and we'll be taking questions from the audience if there's any. Okay, cool. I'll just come over. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, two questions. Uh, so I teach at a university in England. Uh, I've had a number of Nigerian students come through. Um, so uh, first question or just comment really is, uh, it, are you just focused on Nigeria? Or have you got members from all over Africa? Africa is a big place. Um, and then secondly, um, what could we do to, um, where students graduate from us, encourage them to think about what they could do in their own country rather than sticking around and trying to get a job in the UK? So I can answer the first question um, since I am the community manager for Oscar. So we are not just in Nigeria. I mean, we did start in Nigeria, but the name says Open Source Community Africa, not Open Source Community Nigeria, right? So we have about, uh, we're about in like nine countries. And in these nine countries, we have 39 chapters, right? So like in Nigeria, we have like a number of chapters in different states in those countries. And then we also have different chapters in nine other countries. And the plan is to continue to to grow this number over time. So who wants to go for the second question? Yeah, I, I think on the university part, uh, and it's something that, like I said, like it's something that would make a lot of sense going forward. It's like, you know, you go study and then you want to build something and then you come into the program. Um, yes, that's going to be very critical. I would, you know, if there's a way for us to have that conversation and partnership, that would be awesome because at the end of the day, the pipeline to get these people into the program is going to be key. Um, right now, we have some current um, ideas that we're testing and there's some initiatives that we're looking at in terms of getting people in. So, of course, that's going to, always going to be the critical part of the, of the project. So, um, and again, that's really great because there are already some existing structure. Like, I know Outreachy, for example, some people that I know did Outreachy um, were a student at some point and then they came into the program and then they did Outreachy and then they ended up getting their job. Um, same thing with, I think, Google Sum of Code, similar structure. Um, there are quite a, other couple projects that are very similar like that. So again, I would imagine that would be very critical, especially when people go in, acquire their skills and they want to get more hands-on experience, so yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, someone else had a question. Um, yeah, but I wanted to clarify something. I came in a bit late, but maybe I missed it. Um, the other thing you say that um, you wanted to collaborate with companies that wanted to take up these people contributing to open source. Uh, but I want to know, like these people contributing to open source, like maybe some of the reasons that maybe they are contributing to open source is that they don't want to have this as company knowledge or like when you say companies taking them out of that, is it that they're recruiting them? Like these people are looking for opportunities for jobs or is it that um, now like the end goal is now not fully trying to dive into open source, but just uh, getting the skill and then being absorbed later because they had um, the line of like, yeah, maybe I'm contributing to open source because I want to give back to the community and not necessarily be paid. So I just needed clarity. Okay, thank you. I'll give that to um, Princess to respond. 
Um, so that's not exactly the end goal. Um, so something that we need to be careful about in open source is that like people have their own paths, right? Um, in some countries, um, people, companies actually fund people that contribute to open source. Um, in Africa, like the story is kind of different, like not, you'd hardly find companies that actually pay people to contribute to open source. So you want to give that person like <laughs> freedom of choice. I still want to contribute to open source. Okay, please keep contributing. Or I want to go get a job somewhere because of course I need to eat food and all that. So you also need to give people that room for choice. So it's not like, oh, companies are coming to absorb these people. You actually want to build open source projects that are sustainable or self-sustaining. And I, I want to be careful about this, but I mean, there, there are companies that um, actually fund open source projects because I mean, these projects don't fund themselves. I mean, think about every open source project here. Like one company that's using that open source project is kind of contributing back in, in one way or the other. So the goal is not to maybe end up um, absorbing those people. Like, I think maybe you mixed up that part, yeah. So if I can, if I can make that real quick, uh, I can speak for my day job. So why I do Oscar, I'm, all, I'm on the side of like hiring. So basically as of today, um, um, we have normal working company structure. And then there's some kind of some tax that some engineers don't really care about internally. Um, Companies are always doing some kind of internal programs that enable people to, you know, contribute to those projects. And of course, she was talking about Kubernetes, started by Google and then got donated by the, to the LF. Now it's a global thing. So again, there's a lot of things that you have to look at, especially if you're looking at the corporate side of things. The, the, the main interesting goal would be the easy, one of the easiest way that people get recruited is true open source contributions, right? So if you look at it from that point of view, it's like, oh, you, you were contributing to Kubernetes, you were contributing to Six Store, you're contributing to a couple other projects. Oh, we use this tool internally. So you probably have a lot more context than any other engineer, right? So that kind of also give room for things. But again, not that fo not the focus, but one of the things that could help. All right, do we have any other question? Okay, no, thank you all so much for joining. We really appreciate you. Do reach out to us if you have any other questions.